Good morning, Malaysia. Welcome to Zeri Podcast. Today we have a special guest, Mr. Adin Ku. Uh, let me introduce Mr. Adin first. Uh, he's an old friend of mine, although he's not that old. Uh, he is an exponent of the arts, literature, a poet, a writer, a prolific writer, and um, well known in the social media uh, network. I, I first got involved with Adin in uh, in this organization called Pusaka, and Adin did a tremendous job, and is still doing job Pusaka mm -hmm. uh, to promote performing arts, doing the Klantan performing arts. Moayo, Menora, uh, Dike Barra, My Putri, and so all works. This was a wonderful time that I had the opportunity to share with him and to help along the way. So today I've invited Edin to talk about not culture so much, but the country. Slightly yeah. a bigger issue, you know. And um, uh, we have many issues to cover, Edin, but uh, let me first say this that. We have, well, after 60 years of BN, AMNO, one party rule, mm -hmm. uh, we have this now uh, uh, multi party rule under Anwar Ibrahim. Mm -hmm. uh, and many of us look forward to this a new era, a new period in the history of the country. And uh, after one year, of course, there are success stories to be shared, to be told, but there are some concerns as well. So we're going to cover both if we can. And uh, But we also want to cover not just the government, because in the system that we have, the opposition parties are equally important role to play. Mm -hmm. The success of the, of the country depends on both. Okay, so that being the case, I'm going to start with the success stories. What what do you see the twelve months of success so far? The one that you kind of like to share. Yeah, I think. Uh, oh, well, thanks very much for having me on, Dato. Um, you know, uh, and I must add that you were uh, actually chairman of our organization uh, at a very crucial time, uh, and so have contributed a great deal actually to uh, making it the credible. I think, organization that it is. Uh, but I think, uh, um, to answer your question, I think we need new yardsticks la, by which to measure uh, success. Uh, um, we are far too prone to looking at success in terms of what a government delivers or doesn't. Uh, when actually we're going through, since 2018, a very interesting democratized process of democratization. Yeah? Uh, and uh, maybe I just clarify something you said earlier. We've not been a one-party government. We've been a one-coalition government for a very long time. Uh, and in fact, I think what, what we are going through is a process of, of uh, essentially trying to evolve out of that Barisan national uh, model. Uh, and, uh, you know, they, they are, the stepping stones are not easy. Uh, but I think we have to acknowledge that that is the greatest success story that actually uh, has uh, Malaysia has brought upon itself, um, you know, from from 2018. The present government's uh, uh, success stories, I suppose, are in a very volatile world. We also have to understand that the world is also very vol volatile. And as a country that has always uh, reached out, we are an export nation, we are you know, a, a, a high trading nation, uh, we are very regionally dependent, we are very continentally dependent. Uh, I think uh, the main challenge really is trying to situate ourselves within that regional, continental and global order. That is the real challenge. Hmm. Okay, on the domestic front, uh, I, I, for example, uh, like this idea that the, the, the price of chicken has now stabilized. I, I like that. <laughs> I think the government has kind of float the price mm -hmm. mechanism, you know, and I think uh, good for Masabu to do this, you know, mm -hmm. at least we know that the chicken price has kind of stabilized. I don't know about eggs and it's also stabilized because I think uh, the government's decision to impose a 400 million fine mm. on the cartel that control the price of feet, which has a bearing on the price of chicken and eggs. 
the fact that they are able to impose this $400 million fine on this group of companies shows the government's determination mm. to get something right in the supply chain of, mm. of this product. So I am happy with that. Mm. You know, price of chicken, price of eggs, I'm happy with that. And I understand that rice, we can buy rice off, uh, overseas now with permits. You know, mm -hmm. Restaurants are given permits to buy direct. It's great. Uh, but there are areas that are of concern, of course, you know, mm -hmm. besides that. So uh, I would like to see a bit more emphasis on the economy, to be honest with yes. you. I, 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 I see, I would like to see more announcement, more measures being taken, uh, not just subsidies, you know. I know we are waiting for the subsidy, this called targeted subsidies, mm. but I don't know how it's going to work. Mm. <laughs> yeah. So I, I'm, I'd like to see a bit more of that. Yeah, I think a lot of soundings have been uh, uh, really right at the heart of the matter. Uh, so things like you spoke of price control and things like that, you know, have had an effect of maybe breaking some of the older problems of monopolies and things like that. Uh, but implementation is, uh, an implementation basically must be associated with sustainability. See? Mm. Uh, so the, the, the implementation of these things, the administration of this must be consistent uh, and sustained uh, because these things, as you know, are very volatile. But they are, of course, the far uh, bigger things that the country needs to grapple with, uh, like whole economic models. Um, we really need to look beyond whether the price of chicken is like this and really address issues of food supply, um, the, whether we can break the rice monopoly, but you know we should actually be uh, uh, generating far more uh, rice production. Uh, I think some of the um, agriculture minister's ideas have been uh, a little, uh, <laughs> uh, how shall we say, a, a little in ingenious. Um, but I don't see, um, I would like to see a lot more in terms of sustained studies uh, and a really committed response to addressing things like uh, uh, food supply, which is really at the core uh, of, of price controls. And I think very importantly, I agree with you, everything... Uh, it is the economy stupid, as you, as we all know. Uh, but uh, I, I don't see us really also developing, uh, like many parts of the rest of the world and the region, uh, al alternative economic models, you know. Uh, and in, in this, let me also just say, uh, I think there we lack um, development models uh, that depart from the old Mahaderist model, you see. Mm. We're still a very hard economy driven. I'm not saying that that, that can actually be uh, completely sidelined, but we need to develop uh, things like uh, soft economic models, um, you know, uh, things like the cultural economy, things like the creative economy, uh, which are playing a very, very important role in countries like Indonesia and Thailand and India. And we don't seem to give any emphasis on that. Mm. Does that, I mean, yeah, you made a good point on that, the soft model, the new innovative model. But can we do all that with uh, without reforming the education? I mean, I, I think what makes it clear to me in, in all those countries that has transformed itself successfully is that their education has also transformed mm. in, in many ways, you know. I mean, I'm not just talking about Singapore. I'm, I'm talking about uh, even China. You know, I remember those days, the early days, you know, when you, China was a, was a very impoverished, poor country, mm. you know. But they were able to transform themselves, you know, education-wise, culturally. They become more global, more modern. They speak English. The taxi drivers must learn how to speak English. Why are we so resistant towards this sort of change? Yeah, we are caught in subliminals, uh, and we are caught in culture wars. <laughs> These are the things that are really setting us back. Uh, actually, even in education, you know, as... Uh, even though the education gets the large shark's mm. share of the budget, yes. a lot of it goes into uh, administration yeah. and the bureaucracy, uh, rather than uh, inculcating a more dynamic and more imaginative uh, education system, you see. Uh, I think we actually have to also go back. We are also very uh, prone to uh, being so um, kind of drunk on the latest trends that uh, come up without us actually, uh, you know, exhaustively looking at what all these things are. Uh, I think uh, one of the very important things with uh, education is that we need to go back to basics, you know. Uh, we're so drawn into technology, we're so in drawn into the digital thing, 
uh, while a lot of our young people are actually yes. uh, kind of insulated yeah. from very fundamental uh, and rudimentary uh, things that are required for human skills. Human skills. Human yeah. skills. Yeah. Uh, and um, we've also come to confuse, uh, you know, the difference between knowledge and information. Um, all that requires a great deal of resources. And I, I don't just mean money, you know, but resources in terms of, uh, of teaching, in terms of having the best quality uh, kind of educators. Uh, what more are uh, institutions of higher learning? Um, and, but we are trapped over things like uh, languages. Um, you know, which language trapped, should prioritize? It's a self-imposed prior trap. Self -imposed it's a self-imposed trap. Limitation. It's actually become, uh, it's become a, a kind of swamp that we can't seem to, to, to get out of. And actually, a lot of the country, in terms of this cultural culture wars, uh, you know, they are tinju dengan bayang bayang. You know, they're shadow boxing. Mm. You and I come from Kelantan. Mm. Uh, we know that the issue of uh, uh, Chinese schools is not an issue in Kelantan at all. In mm. fact, so many Malay kids uh, yeah. are rushing to go into 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 Chinese schools uh, because they want a more complete and a more worldly education. Yeah. That is not to uh, sideline the importance of Malay, but I think a lot of attention needs to be put also upon uh, the Malay language as a national language, um, but also as a language of learning. And there's no investment in this, you see. Uh, I've always said that I think all Malaysians should be naturally trilingual. And yet here we are stuck uh, in debates and, uh, you know, uh, confrontations over one language. And I must add, uh, Dato, as well, that I don't think these confrontations and these, uh, you know, uh, uh, debates are much of concern to the general public yeah. who just really want to move on yeah. uh, and, and develop all their, yeah. all, all their skills as people. Yes. Now, that, that brings me into this issue of uh, government. You see, the people move along with the leaders, really. I mean, we are always like, follow the leaders. This is our culture, really. Our, it's, it's almost our national trait. You know? We don't dissent. We don't oppose. We don't really uh, disagree publicly mm. about many things. But with that in mind, why is it that our government, our leaders, do not take the step to transform these values, these cultural values? I mean, i give you an example. I thought a simple way, public education is a bit more difficult to mm. deal with. But for example, Jakim. Mm. Okay? I'll give you an example of Jakim. The Jakim is a, 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 a just started as a department in the Prime Minister's mm. office uh, to organize the Quran reading competition. Mm. Started that way. Mm. Now it is a $1.5, $1.8 billion entity. But if you ask them what do they spend the money on, they have difficulty explaining. Mm. And I mean, the published statements from the Director General is that firstly, we don't give the details of the spending. Mm. But Jakim focuses itself on mainly on policies mm. to prevent Muslims from becoming deviants, mm -hmm. you know, something like that. That in itself is hard to comprehend. What mm. do they do with that kind of money? Of course, they spend a lot of money also on this halal kind of processing, uh, but publishing works, research work, but there's nothing tangible. Now, I would have thought the one way to set the mood right for the country is for the government to deal with issues like this. Where do you really need to spend that much money? Because the Muslims will always have different views about everything, just mm -hmm. like other religions too. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's no end to this discourse mm -hmm. or this, this, this religious interpretation. And what is the success story of, of, of Jackie? Mm -hmm. How many deviants have we rectified or, mm. or sorted out, you mm. know? How many Shias have we mm. uh, managed to control? I mean, this sort of thing, I thought it's a waste of resources. That's what I'm saying is that if we are willing to spend a lot of money on something not so clear cut, mm. I'm sure we are spending a lot of money on other areas as well that is mm. clearly not useful. Mm. Now, is that something that the government wants to look at it or they deliberately allow it to Float along because it's convenient. Okay. Um, you know, um, there's a lot of idealization of uh, what this administration, uh, and especially the prime minister, represents. Uh, he, it has, after all, been a 25-year-long struggle 
uh, for systemic reform. Um, this is not to 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 make excuses or for anyone, but. Uh, I think one of uh, the problems that we as the public sometimes have is to distinguish what our ideals and our idaman are and what certain social and polit political realities uh, mm. are. Yeah. Uh, so I think a real national conversation needs to happen again. Uh, we are in many ways in this period of uh, democratization in a kind of post-1969 scenario without the bloodshed of May 13. Mm. Uh, but there are very fundamental things that simply are not working anymore. Mm. Um, and I think one of the, the, the things that Malaysians really have to deal with is start to understand what political power actually is. Right? We have a serious uh, issue about understanding what power and the exercise of power is. Um, this is a, also a problem of... And when we talk about education, Nadato, I've, this is something I've always uh, uh, kind of stressed. Uh, we always talk about education in terms of, you know, what happens in schools, mm. what our syllabus is. No one talks about public education, mm. I think, which is the most crucial thing in this period, again, of democratization, uh, that there really is uh, greater and greater openness uh, in the way we discuss things. And there actually is a great deal of openness because you get people offering comments all over the place now. It's totally uncontrollable. <clears throat> but I think... Um, I think in more mainstream ways, uh, uh, the educative process uh, really needs to to take place. You, you think the government will tolerate this? I think openness? it's already happening, and it's already in inevitable. But I see a lot of uh, I see a lot of uh, media people telling me that they don't that uh, things are not so open after all. Uh, they're not as open as we would like them to be, yeah. but they're certainly a lot more open than they were in 2015. I can tell you that, mm. uh, right? So I think uh, we need to push and we need to rationalize. And I know a lot of people hate hate this kind of word because it seems so heavy and it seems so elevated, but we need to intellectualize a lot of these processes uh, and that's not happening. Mm. Well, I hope you are right on that truth. I mean, we really need a lot of discussion, you know, mm. or, and... People should be willing to listen uh, from all sides, you know. Now, this is where I want to come back to you on the opposition side. What, what, what have, what's your assessment? I mean, I know the quality of our politicians are not always great mm -hmm. because there's no entry level to join politics. That's right. <laughs> and uh, if you elect people who are not good enough, then you'll never get a good product. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just like everything else. But coming back to the opposition side, mm -hmm. you know, uh, what have they done well and what they have failed? Uh, I have some bad news. I think our politics is totally broken. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, so we're going, it's, it's, it's a paradox, yeah, because we are going through a period of democratization. As I said, uh, a lot of people took a very brave step, for example, to look for a different future in 2018, but they got the same political culture, yeah. uh, haunted by the same personalities. Mm -hmm. Uh, if we wonder why parliament is the way it is today, well, it is because your parliamentarians are sorry. of that level, I'm yeah. sorry to say. Yeah. Um, I, I think a, a lot more needs to be done uh, on identifying issues uh, and uh, really understanding. I think, you know, if I may say, um, I think that very brief respite, a short period uh, of the Ismail Sabri administration uh, showed the potential for us developing a rather mature uh, political understanding between opposition and, 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 and the government, you see. The, um, you know, the, the parliamentary agreement that they came up with, I can't remember the term now. Um, uh, agree and consent and agree, something like that, anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I think that showed some kind of maturity. But again, our problem is, how do you sustain that? Mm. Uh, we don't seem to have very, very, uh, very much stamina uh, for us to take such progressive steps uh, before scuttling into all our strange mm. ethno-cultural divisions, you see. Mm. Um, like I said, I think uh, a lot of our political process is broken because politics is no longer... But you have not um, answered my question. Which is? What do you think of PAS, Bersatu? No, I think uh, they're not, uh, uh, they not effective as a, as a, because they fuel the cultural wars rather than not. They are very interesting as political parties. I've said this very publicly before. I think PAS is one of the most disciplined uh, parties, uh, very true to the ideology. Um, and they have very strict hierarchies and work really as a, uh, as a unit. But it doesn't mean that they deliver 
politically. Uh, I've yet to see any of their states, and we know Kelantan for 25 years. Uh, it's you know it's it's like infrastructurally kind of but, uh, okay. seriously, seriously broken. Okay, but but looking from a, from the a Malay perspective, which which I think is important because mm-hmm. the majority of the people in this country, Malays, with the AMNO being kind of sidelined, or of course for their own mistakes and mm-hmm. all that. But the other, the only other alternative would be the 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 past Pesatu Alliance. Mm. But you think that's the route the Malays should take or will take, or do you think Abno can can revive itself for some reason? I don't think the Malays know what route route to take. They don't. No, I don't also <laughs> believe that the Malays are working somehow as a homogenous unit. Uh. Um, you know, look. Uh, voting patterns have been very depressed. The last state elections, you know, you had an average of about, you know, 51% and, you know, maybe slightly higher in Tranganu or, so, or something like that. But the Malays have a lack of choice. Um, the Malays don't seem to be able to, to cross the stream yet into complete multiracial politics. Uh, but that may be a possibility. But uh, uh, multiracial parties must also make an effort, really, to, to try and uh, understand what multiracial politics, multicultural politics actually is. Uh, so in many of the states, in Klantan, for example, you know, I can never understand why there has been no, in Klantan where the government is the opposition, uh, there has been no nurturing of real leadership uh, from the ground. Uh, it is a strategy, it is a movement that you need to come up with. You can't be putting the same guy there who has lost four elections, you know, and still putting <laughs> him there. Uh, so I think uh, what what the government, who is the opposition in the in the East Coast, is really suffering from is a, a, a crisis in credibility. And they don't seem to take, make, make much effort, you see. Uh, so I think um, I, I'm not of that persuasion that kind of uh, damns the Malays as being, you know, just people who want religion and ideology. Uh, that's really, really a silly approach. Uh, I think um, the democratization process is going through most effectively, uh, most uh, intensely among the Malays. I'm afraid that if you talk about lack of choices, uh, I think the non-Malays are in the same predicament, uh, right? Uh, at least in, in, in Sarawak, it seems that people have uh, only one party choice, one coalition choice, but it's a coalition that offers a kind of future. Uh, over here, I think we are very much in a tra- transit, transit, transitory period. And that I must say, I'm very, I get very impatient with things like calling Malaysia apartheid or a Taliban country. Uh, I think this uh, shows a deeper wound yeah. uh, that we as a collective have, which is we have no sense of our history, mm. and so we have no sense of our social realities. Yes. And uh, I want to come back to Amno a bit. Uh, I, as you know, I have a soft spot for Amno, although I've migrated from a few places, but I'm still an Amno member after 50 years. So <laughs> uh, am I doing the right thing, being an Amno? <laughs> Uh, as you say, your heart is there. So yeah, you, but I'm, I'm not the young generation. Yeah. I, I, to be honest, uh, I cannot understand Amno at the moment. Uh, it is dealing with a kind of psychosis, uh, and it's riven with all kinds of difficulties at the moment. Uh, it can't actually position itself um, <clears throat> really anywhere in the political landscape because it's so used to 64 years of, 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 of uh, leading the country. Uh, another thing is that I can't understand with Amno in its term of reviving itself is that it seems to have no memory. Uh, so it doesn't fall back on, on the many things it has been able to achieve for this country uh, because n- none of its young party cadres uh, know anything about the party. Mm. Uh, they have no memory of Tun Raza. They have no memory of Tun Kabir Rahman. They have no memory of Tun Hussein On, you know, who really I think was one of the most uh, successful of our prime ministers in in terms of consolidating the Mubim Putra economy, the Mubim Putra sense of identity. Uh, so, you know, how is it, is it actually going to come out of this, of, of the swamp? Uh, uh, you need a uh, foundational, uh, you know, a, a foundation for the, for, for the party. But right now, it's just very, very riven by personality politics. Uh, it always has been, perhaps, mm-hmm. but it also had a particular kind of yes. uh, approach and... Uh, but it seems to be quite desperate at the moment. Yeah. He can't even seem to understand what he wants to do with Kairi yeah. Jamaluddin. 
Oh, you are a fan of Haile Jawalun. No, he's not a fan of all that. I'm, <laughs> well, I think you, know, you are, but it's okay. I think he's good looking, you know. So I, and, I have uh, political distance, <laughs> sir. I've been but, a journalist but, for thirty three years. But, but the one thing that that I find it worrying for me, as an AMNO member, is this: I don't think AMNO can revive on its own motion, on its own initiative. It has reached a state of, I think the the, the, the voters have rejected them very clearly, very clearly, you know, and. Yet there are still AMNO leaders who seems to think that they can somehow find a solution to the party's problem, the country's problem. Mm. I would rather suggest that they look outside for help. Mm. You know, outside meaning maybe they should talk to the prime minister. I mean, his own party hasn't got that much Malay strength. Mm. Maybe the prime minister can save AMNO. Maybe the Prime Minister can save Najib to save Amno, to save the bigger thing. I'm just saying that shouldn't we explore these possibilities rather than just looking at the traditional way of, oh, we will overcome, we will find a solution. There's no solution. Yes, yeah, sir. Actually, if I may just interject, yes, yes. Inter interject at the moment. Yes, you know, this is all fine. Uh, we are in a period of very open possibilities. Mm. Uh, all kinds of alliances are yeah. possible. I like but that. What, what is the psychosis of AMNO? I don't think AMNO knows. Okay. Uh, you know, uh, I also, uh, with the Malays, this is an <clears throat> interesting part of that democratic process that I'm talking about. For 64 years, they were, they were, they were supportive of, of AMNO, largely, uh, for maybe about uh, 40 of those years and 50 of those years very willingly, very voluntarily supportive of AMNO. But for about 15 years, they just felt they had no choice. Uh, now that they seem to have choice, you know, there's a certain kind of uh, resentment about AMNO-style political culture. All these things need to be addressed. Mm. And I don't think there's a very concerted effort at talking to the Malays and engaging with the Malays and trying to understand what the Malay sense of the future is. Because I am absolutely certain uh, and there are some people in the non-Malay quarters who believe that the Malay sense of their future is Talibanism. I don't believe that at mm. all. Mm. Uh, in fact, I think there's the, the Malays have had too much social mobility and too much social progress uh, yeah. over the years to want that kind of, of, of future. I'm not saying it's not possible because systemically all kinds of things can happen. And Malays uh, like cars. <laughs> if you look at the number of Mercedes in Clinton, I think a lot of people like cars. But you so, know, once the, so yeah. if you like cars, if you like Mercedes, mm -hmm. you can't be Taliban. Yes, and we know that Mercedes during <laughs> so, COVID sold no, very no, high but, in Clinton. Yeah. No, no, but but coming back to this possibility, that I mean, shouldn't shouldn't I'm no leaders, the current leaders I'm talking about, and the guys who are in the cabinet, the guys who are in the majlis, they're thinking, why don't they speak out? It's like. Are they scared of what? I don't understand. The party is in the ruins, and they themselves are there at the behest or at the grace of someone. Yes. Why can't they speak up? These but, leaders. But but this is this is uh, this is the the effect, or this is the outcome of a culture of desperation. So there is a culture of desperation in Amno. It's uh, you know so um, uh, uh, question of not just leadership but leadership succession. Uh, becomes a major issue. Who is actually, uh, is that control over the party? We are not very sure. Uh, many different leaders have, have their own, own, own um, uh, followers and own persuasion. Uh, and it seems that cloak and dagger politics, which has long been <laughs> a part of the culture of AMNO, is uh, getting more prevalent rather than uh, you know, taking yeah. a back seat. Yeah, but okay, cloak and dagger. Let me ask you, aren't you, don't you feel a bit of nostalgia for Najib? Uh, in my conversations, as I said, I'm always politically very distanced. Mm. Uh, so I'm no fan of this person or, 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 or that person. Uh, but in my conversations with people, uh, I think uh, there seems to be uh, this sense of creeping nostalgia. Uh, everybody does dump on him about how stupid the entire 1MDB yeah. uh, fiasco was. Uh, but in many other things, this is what I would say uh, for him. I think he was a prime minister who understood 
um, the place of Malaysia in the world at one time. Uh, and many of the things that he was, uh, you know, his relationship with China, his proximity with the Middle East, all these kinds of things, these were very interesting geopolitical yeah. positioning of, of uh, Malaysia. And I think his effort to transform the civil service, that, to me, was the Malaysian most, transformation, most, yeah. most powerful message. Yes. Unfortunately, it was like, couldn't get through. Well, because he made this terrible error. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> we, we all made mistakes. Did. We all made mistakes. Yeah, but, you know, uh, I did interview him mm. once. Uh, and uh, I asked him a very interesting question. This was already, you know, uh, I think during COVID, uh, just before he actually uh, was found guilty of the SRC thing. And I asked him, and I, I also wanted to uh, uh, look at uh, his administration more comprehensively. Uh, so I asked him this question and I, and I asked him, worded it in this way. I said, let us uh, take it, take you for your word that you actually didn't know what was happening. You know, people were, 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 were scheming around you. Mm. But when it was all revealed, shouldn't you have resigned? Mm. His answer was very interesting. He said, I would have resigned if I didn't think I could save it. Uh, so, you know, save it. Uh, so I think uh, that was, that is a very interesting uh, uh, paradoxical kind of situation. What do you mean by, by yeah. save it? Um, uh, you know, and then uh, we saw all these kinds of other efforts that went awry. So I think that was a real curse. Uh, we really still, it gets more and more murky, I think. Uh, but I can't understand why he stepped into that in the first place because lots of other things uh, the economic transformation, the uh, transformation plans, I think. And, and really, if you ask me, as a geopolitical observer, uh, he was very astute. Okay, so I just want to come to the last point for our conversation today. And that is the worrying thing that happened a few days ago. So-called attempt at the, the Dubai move, MPs getting together to unseat the prime minister or make representation to the king, that effect, and the reactions of the government, mm. that worries me. Mm. You know, we have his political secretary lodge a police report as if a crime had been committed, and talking about, I'm not only just talking about using SOSMA. SOSMA, as you know, is a, is a, is a replacement of ISA, where you can be detained, you know, 28 days without remand. What worries me is that why is it that this Dubai move, whatever move you call it, Sheraton move or Klang move, and all these political maneuverings, mm. why should the government treat it as criminal? Because if that is the way we are moving forward, mm. we will never have a peaceful transition of power mm. in this country because we will always cite security reasons. We will always cite SOSMA. We will always cite some you know, terrorist plan, plot, that worries me because this is the reign of the most reformist-minded mm. prime minister. I, the last thing I would expect him is to go along this route. Mm. The simplest thing to do is to call the bluff. If this group of MPs in Dubai think they have the numbers, call the bluff. Mm. Go to parliament and then you raise your hand and you know you're defeated. Mm. And then we can move on to other things. So I just wanted to take this out to you because I think this is worrying. If, if we are going to in, into this mode of warfare, what, what do you think? No, I, I agree with you. And I think many of what concerns most people uh, who are worried about a kind of uh, trend towards uh, an increasingly authoritarian state is the fact that um, the present prime minister is essentially uh, our model uh, reformist. Yes. Uh, but we have to also understand, that's why I say, uh, very often, uh, we don't understand what political realities are. This is not, uh, uh, you know, an attempt to absolve anybody. But in, in, in us wanting to overcome further situations of this kind, we must kind of under really try and understand uh, what political mechanisms are and place ourselves in that, in, in that politics, sure. you see. Uh, um, in, in many ways, um, uh, this is also why we haven't rationalized power. So the moment we feel threatened, we will act towards that we'll kind react, of, of, yeah. of, of, of power. And, and this is very prevalent in a lot of reformist societies. Turkey is a very good example 
uh, Erdogan, who is a good friend of the Prime Minister, started out, of course, as very much a reformist uh, and today has, has, has authoritarian impulses. So until we work out this issue, so we look at anti-hopping law, for example. You know, it has too many loopholes. Yes. How did it get away with that, yeah. right? So it really is about whether we can consolidate the system and change the political culture. Uh, this Prime Minister can be very successful if this administration really reaches out and proves the one thing that even Pakatan Harapan didn't prove in 2018. As I said, we all voted for change and we got the same political culture. If this administration can transform the political culture with its new alliances and, 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 uh, you know, and, and go through some difficulties at the moment. But the most important thing, Dato, is we must have consultative government because we have an increasingly maturing uh, electorate uh, that uh, are finding it increasingly frustrated, getting very alienated, getting very fed up of the same old political culture. Okay. Okay, I, mean, I think we have spent about 35 minutes or so. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, sir. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, I hope you like this podcast. If you do, you press follow, share, like, and subscribe. Thank you very much. Thanks, Dato. Thank you.